Welcome to the Money Investing Podcast. I'm your host, Clay Fink. And today we bring Adam Ziesel onto the show. Adam, welcome to the podcast. Clay, thanks for having me. Now, Adam, I had a chance to read your book, Where the Money Is, over the past few days. And I really enjoyed it and just loved the frameworks you put in place that we're going to be discussing during this episode. In your book, you walk through why the game has changed for value investors. You mentioned that no subset of investors has had a harder time adapting to the changes brought on by the digital age than value investors. Walk us through what your process is on this. Well, you know, Clay, um, I mean, I really wrote the book to help value investors like myself think through the dramatic changes uh, that have occurred in the world over the last 10 years. And, um, you know, as I say in the book, you know, 10 years ago, only two of the top 10 companies uh, by market cap in the world were tech. And today, eight are. And, um, you know, depending on how you slice it, half to two thirds of the incremental value of the stock market over the last five or 10 years has come from tech, even after this big latest correction. So it's come quite suddenly and quite dramatically. And what I found is that very few people are talking about how to reconcile value investing, this century old discipline created by Ben Graham and then propagated by your fellow Cornhusker, Warren Buffett, how to reconcile it with tech. Because tech, ever since it began its ascendancy, has been looked very expensive by traditional metrics. And value investors are used to looking at these stodgy old economy companies and looking at them at a lens that basically says, how cheap are they? And, you know, as I convey in the book, this is not an abstract uh, concept for me. This had to do with me and my record and my livelihood. I was a successful value investor for, geez, 15, 20 years, but sometime in the middle of the last decade, my system of looking for low PE, low price to book stocks just stopped working. And so I was forced with a sort of, um, you know, fork in the, in the road, you know, either, either I stick with this system uh, or I say, well, maybe some of the metrics are broken. And I've decided that it's the latter, that value investing needs to evolve, to widen its aperture, to, to, to increase its scope, to include, you know, these new economy companies. Mm. You know, you mentioned that you had to make that decision of, is your strategy broken or is it just out of favor for the time being? And I think a lot of value investors are falling into that same conundrum of being in between a rock and a hard place where... You know, I hear many value investors just say, you know, reversion to the mean is a thing. And eventually, you know, these strategies of the past are going to, you know, they're going to come back. It's just a matter of time. But you've heard that for the last, say, five years or so. And it's. Yeah. Well, I just think that's false. I just think that's absurd on its face, as the lawyers would say. And I think that if you asked any 12 year old, they would be able to talk as intelligently, if not more intelligently than than us uh, in the value community, because we've been so set in our ways and value investing has worked, uh, especially, you know, particularly, as you say, reversion to the mean has worked. But but let's just talk commonsensically, like brick and mortar retail. What's the reversion to the mean of brick and mortar retail? Like used to be when I was coming along on Wall Street in the 90s, that, you know, retail would grow with GDP, brick and mortar retail. That's, is that going to happen? Like, is, is it somehow Macy's going to go back to reverting to the mean of 3% growth every year? Or are they, you know, is there something wrong with the business? You know, likewise, is Amazon going to revert to the mean? Like, what's reversion to the mean for Amazon? Like, Amazon has you know, 1% of worldwide retail sales. They have maybe 6% of U.S. retail sales. Like, where's the mean? You know, this digital revolution has thrown all those relationships out of whack. So I think reversion to the mean, sure, for some companies that are durable, you know, manufacturing, some chemical companies, yes, reversion to the mean works. But for many, many industries, 
you know, it's like Bruce Springsteen said, you know, those jobs are going, boys, and they ain't coming back. It reminds me of who you mentioned, my fellow Cornhusker, Warren Buffett. You know, he's kind of been. I thought you were going to say Bruce Springsteen. <laughs> he's my fellow New Jerseyan. He's Buffett's been hammered for, you know, not buying tech, even though he's understood many of these really good businesses, but he did eventually buy Apple in 2016, you know, in very large size. And, you know, to be fair, I guess Apple was trading, trading at a, you know, pretty good price back then. Walk us through maybe why Apple is the only tech company that Buffett's really come around to. Yeah, look, I, like you, have a tremendous amount of admiration for Buffett. He is the, the Mozart of our industry, and there will probably never be as great an investor like him. Uh, in the book, I produce his long-term record versus the S&P. And, you know, the S&P over his 60 years looks like this, kind of, and his record is like that. It's just, it's, it's almost hard to believe. But, um, so he's a brilliant guy. Um, but he's also 91. And, um, you know, this tech revolution happened when he was, I don't know, 75. So, you know, he can be forgiven if he's not, you know, quite up to speed on everything that's going on. I mean, he famously says he doesn't read email and, you know, so on and so forth. So he's not exactly swimming in the tech ecosystem. But I think the reason he liked Apple is that, uh, you know, it reminds him of an old line consumer product company that, you know, which he he, he he's invested in for many, many years with great success. It reminds him of Coca-Cola, basically, something that's daily, something that's habit forming, something that, you know, consumers form a very strong bond with. Um so I think that the famous story now is that he, he, he started to see how powerful a product Apple was when he took his great grandchildren to uh, Dairy Queen in Omaha. And, uh, you know, nothing uh, excites little kids more than ice cream, but he couldn't even get them off their phones to, to tell them what they wanted because they were so engrossed with their iPhones. And he said, well, if, if, you know, if an iPhone can trump Dairy Queen, which by the way, he also owns, uh, then it must be a pretty big product. And then he then he got into more complicated reasons, but you know, equally valid reasons like, well, wow, you know, you have all your music on Apple, you have all your photos on your iPhone. You know, the switching costs, to use the formal business term, are so hard that it's going to be very hard to get Apple's billion users off that platform. Um, and, um, so, so those are all the attributes. And then I think what distinguishes Apple from Google and Amazon and some of the others that he hasn't bought is that it's, it's a much more mature company and it acts much more like a mature company, which he's much more familiar with. You know, he came of age when, you know, leaders in cola and beer and soap were clearly established and the route to success was just sort of grinding profits out slowly higher. That's the way Apple is. You know, Apple is basically has a billion users and most of their growth is not from, you know, new phones. They're just replacing old phones. You know, when the upgrade cycle comes, it's from the services, it's from the app. So it's sort of a mature product and they're much less ambitious than, uh, say, Google and Amazon, I think I say in the book that their R&D budget is about a third as a percentage of sales versus Facebook and Google and Amazon. So that's a lot, you know, that, that uh, to spend, you know, 33% only of what Google and Amazon spend on R&D is a big delta. And of course, they have a huge share of purchase program which he loves. He loves them returning excess capital. And he's nervous about companies reinvesting the capital. And that's precisely what most tech companies are doing. now. Amazon, Google are reinvesting all their profits. They're not bringing them down to the bottom line. They're not showing a dollar of profits today because they think they can turn it into $3 of profits in five or 10 years. I think that's a wise strategy, but it's one that Buffett historically has been very nervous about. Mm -hmm. And that's why he owns Apple and not Google and Amazon, mm -hmm. if you ask me. Yeah, very good points. You know, 
you know, we have these two schools of thought. We have the value investing side where, you know, you're trying to buy something for less than it's worth. You're st- sticking with what, what you know and really understand. And then you have this, you know, digital technology revolution where a lot of these tech companies aren't going to be going anywhere. You know, they seem to, there's a phrase, they're just eating the world. How can we combine these two schools of thought and apply it to our investment strategy? Well, it's a good question precisely because it puts its finger on one of the great red herrings of the investment business, which is that there's there's a difference between growth investing and value investing. Now, I happen to have looked into the matter and I can tell you that that, that whole style box was created by Morningstar. When the mutual fund craze started, when the baby boomers started to have to figure out how to retire in the 80s and 90s, and they got invested in stocks, they didn't understand which fund did what and which fund did this. So Morningstar said, well, these funds are growth funds uh, because they invest in, you know, stocks that are growing faster than normal. And these stocks are value funds because these stocks invest in old beaten up businesses that are statistically cheap. So that's how it started. But if you think about it, you know, growth and value investing, there's no distinction. And I'll explain why. All things being equal, growth is a component of value, correct? Like if I showed you two businesses, but one was going to grow 5% for 10 years and one was going to grow 10% for 10 years, which would you choose? Yeah, all else equal to 10% growth. So are you a growth investor? Well. Or are you just an investor? Right, you know. Who, who likes returns? Everyone's, you know, everyone's a value investor at heart. They just want to pay, you know, buy something for less than it's worth. Well, but that's, that, that's right. That, you know, growth is a component of value. And Buffett has been beating this drum for 30 years. In his 1993 annual report, he said, I'm sorry, folks, but buying stuff with low PEs and low price to book ratio does not constitute a value purchase, nor does buying stuff with a high PE and a high price to book constitute a bad investment. It all depends. It all depends. So, In the book, you know, the reason I wrote the book and the reason I think it can be of value to your listeners is these tech stocks are value stocks in the sense that they are valuable, but they just don't look valuable on traditional metrics. So, like, why have they gone up so much in the last decade? Has it all been a hoax or is there something that the numbers aren't showing us? And I think the answer is clearly the latter, you know, unless you really believe that Alphabet and, and Amazon are going to go the way of pets.com did in the dot-com bust, then we've got to reframe the way we look at these stocks. They don't look like value purchases, but they're exceedingly valuable. One thing I found interesting in your process is you're looking at price last. You know, you're talking about, how some investors will run some filter and look for cheap stocks. So the first thing they're looking at is the price relative to the earnings. So price is like the very first thing you're looking at, but in your process, you were looking at the business first and, you know, seeing if it flows through your checklist and if it, you know, checks all the boxes and then you're looking at price at the very end, which I found pretty interesting. Yeah. And look, this is a, a reversal of my what I started out. You know, I started at Sanford Bernstein, which runs a computer model to screen for the cheapest 10 percent of stocks in the universe or or it did when when I was there. And um, and that worked. It worked for many, many years precisely because, you know, the economy wasn't changing. So if retail sales were cheap, they were going to go back to normal. If, you know, consumer products companies were a little expensive, they were going to go back to normal. Well, there is no normal anymore. You know, certain giant sectors of our economy are under existential pressure from tech. And tech is, you know, similarly growing like a weed. Um, So I had to sort of rethink my price first equation. And, you know, I basically put the business quality first. Because, you know, 
in this era, if you're either on the sort of the right side of the digital divide or the wrong side. And so price becomes much less important than it would in, a, in an economy where there's stat- stasis and you can count on things like things going back to normal, reversion to the mean. By the way, I think Buffett, if you asked him, would probably put business quality first. Then he looks at the price. Um, so, uh, yeah. It's, you know, I do think quality is obviously really important. You know, in the digital age, you know, you see these monopoly type companies, very strong moats, very strong network effects. And those have been the strong outperformers, especially over the last decade. Talk about some of the things you look for when looking for a quality company. Well, it's precisely the concept of a moat clay, which you say, you know, that's Buffett's term. Other ways to say it is, does the company have an edge? Does the company have some special sauce? Uh, you know, the business school term is competitive advantage. So, you know, most companies, whether they be tech companies or, or other companies, are doomed to sort of failure, or if not failure, then mediocrity, because capitalism is so competitive. It's, you know, I say in the book, it's like the Hunger Games. I mean, people just beat each other's brains out uh, to, to, to compete. And, and the result is, is usually that the consumer wins, whether it's a business consumer or a, an individual consumer, all these companies falling all over each other to lower prices, improve performance, all for the benefit of the customer. It's a great system because the consumer ends up winning and all too often the, the companies end up, you know, sort of just barely earning their cost of capital. Um, so I put in the book, you know, GoPro was a great, you know, early success and, you know, sold selfie sticks and couldn't sell enough of them. And, but because they didn't have an edge, you know, because a selfie stick, you know, one selfie stick is more or less like another, that invited competition like bees to honey. And, you know, the price of selfie sticks just went shh, shh, shh. And, you know, if you look at Vonage's stock chart, uh, it will reflect that. <laughs> so you need companies that can withstand that competition, you know, that, that can withstand like people say, oh, that's a great business. I'm going to go get myself a piece of it. And they're like, oh, I can't. Uh, that's the business you want. So, you know, <laughs> Google is the, is the perfect example. I mean, Google uh, created the fastest and most relevant search engine early on. Its market share went from nothing to 65% to 95%. You know, uh, Bing spent $15 billion trying to compete against uh, Google, couldn't do it. The, the, the search engine is just inferior. You know, I put an example in there of a reporter from Wired Magazine typing in some search terms and with Google, he gets great search term, you know, search results. And with Bing, he gets nonsense. It's less known, well known that Amazon tried to compete in search. Uh, you know, some time ago, Bezos hired the, the search developer uh, who, had, who had created the first search engine for Yahoo. He was like the, you know, the, there at the founding and he gave him all this resources and said, go, go compete against Google. And the guy quit a couple of years later and he went and joined uh, Google. And, you know, apparently Bezos threw a huge temper tantrum. Uh, And when he settled down, he said, you know, said to his employees, treat Google like a mountain. You can climb it, but you can't move it. So these are the businesses you want. You know, I urge you and your, your listeners, you know, when you're looking at companies, the first thing you should ask is, who can outcompete these guys? How can they outcompete them? What's going to happen? Put them in the Hunger Games arena and sort of mentally play out what happens. And if you can't find uh, a s- scenario in which they're beaten, uh, or even better, if you've witnessed people trying to take them on, as uh, you know, Microsoft and Amazon did with with Google, then you're on to something. You know, it sounds great in theory, but trying to apply these, you know, I, these ideas and practice is the really difficult part. Um, Absolutely. You know, Surfing sounds easy. Yeah. Right? 
Right. Um, you know, people will probably listen to this and get really excited. You know, you can get a quality monopoly compounder that's going to grow at 20% per year, but you know, your conviction is going to be tested along the way and there's going to be bump bumps along the road. I pulled together the five year returns on four big tech heavy hitters and the disparity is just incredible. I got Microsoft. The five year return is 258%. Apple, 272%, both, you know, exceptionally well, heavily outperforms the market. And then I looked at Netflix, 13% over the five year period, and Meta or Facebook, 2%. Talk to us about, you know, why you think there's just this drastic difference between, you know, these heavy, heavy hitters. Well, it's, it's an excellent point. And yeah, everything sounds easy uh, in theory and everything is hard uh, in practice. So I, I take your question, you know, very seriously. Uh, and, and, I'm, and I applaud you for, you know, putting the statistics around those four companies. It's something that an actuary would, would do. Um, but um, yeah, look, and, 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 and you're exactly right, Clay, that your, your, your conviction does get tested along the way. You know, my conviction is now being tested with Amazon down 40%. It's in the doghouse. Everyone hates it. You know, nope, I have no problem. And as I say in the book, even Apple, you know, since the iPhone was introduced, you look at the chart, it's like, wow, what a great stock. But in reality, the fact is that over the last every three or four years, it lost a third of its value. Like people forget that. Like, oh, Apple's a winner. Yeah, well, it didn't feel too good when it went from, you know, 60 to 40, you know, in 2011 or whatever it was. But to your to your specific question, it all comes back to moats. So Microsoft has moats. Its office tools have moats. Google has tried to compete against it, right? With Google Docs and all that. Price was free, free, free to use Google Docs. How many people use Google Docs? I can't even remember what the uh, the, the Excel equivalent of them is called, like Sheets or yeah. something. It's a horrible program and no one's gonna switch. So Microsoft has modes. Apple has modes for reasons we've talked about. It's a great product. Everyone loves it. I have the old one because I'm, yeah. I'm like you, I'm cheap. <laughs> but, you know, to get onto an Android, like, it's going to be hard, mm -hmm. you know, hard to switch. My family will get mad at my dad because he's got the Android and everyone else has the iPhones and we're trying to message each other. And, you know, the messages get all right. messed up, sending pictures. Right. Yeah, exactly. So, so Apple has a moat, um, but I've never liked uh, Netflix and I've never liked Facebook or Meta uh, and, and precisely because they haven't had moats. Like I look at Netflix and I was like, well, yeah, I like, I, don't, I subscribe to Netflix and I like Netflix, but I also like Amazon Prime video too. And it's free. And oh my God, Disney's starting one? Okay. And Peacock is starting one? Okay. And and Hulu and HBO Max and Parent, like what what kind of mode is that? Like here again, it's like 12-year-old stuff. It's not complicated. So so what ends up happening, you know, to make it a little more complicated and put it in business terms, is there it becomes an arms race where, you know. Uh, Netflix, I think, is on pace to spend $21 billion in content spend this year. Two or three years ago, it was $10 billion. So, like, they just have to keep producing more and more content to keep going. And they got all these, you know, very uh, deep-pocketed rivals, some of whom don't have to spend on content because they have huge libraries, like Disney. So some competitors are even advantaged relative to Netflix, and Netflix is having to just, you know, spend money on nuclear warheads, so to speak, uh, to, to just keep up. And until until that abates, I just don't see them having enough moat. I don't see them having any sort of competitive advantage. The, the barrier to entry, to use the business term, in the, in the content streaming business is just too low. 
like the barrier to entry in search is extremely high. You know, Microsoft spent $15 billion to try to build search. Bing is, you know, a joke. So, you know, likewise, I've never liked Facebook, uh, never. Uh, and, and, and it's main, part of it is I just don't like the product. Uh, I just don't enjoy using it. And I'm not sure how many people really enjoy using it. Like, like when I go to Google, I'm pretty fired up. You know, like I know I'm going to get a good search result. And like I have a friend who uses Amazon. I use Amazon a lot. I have a friend who uses it. He says, every time I get a package, it feels like it's my birthday. Like nobody feels that way about Facebook. I don't think, you know, um, they're just on it because everyone else is on it. And when you don't have the secret sauce, it makes you vulnerable to competition. So look at what happened with Facebook. Look at, look at the history of Facebook. Here's the history of Facebook, basically. I mean, you can argue whether the, the, he stole the network or whatever. That, that's, that's immaterial for our discussion. But it's certainly true that when competitors are, began to arise, um, in, uh, WhatsApp and then Instagram, you know, rather than try to make Facebook an, a more awesome product, he just bought them. And there are emails uh, from Zuckerberg saying, you know, it's better to buy than to compete, which, I, by the way, I don't understand why the Federal Trade Commission has not been able to make a case against Facebook for buying its rivals because it's illegal in this country to buy someone uh, to put them out of business, uh, to buy a competitor to put them out of business. So he bought potential rivals and put them into the Facebook fold. And then when it became obvious that this was a pattern of his and he couldn't do it anymore, you know, and the next awesome uh, app which is much more uh, interesting to people than Facebook. Uh, TikTok came along and started sucking off viewers from Facebook. What did, what did Zuckerberg do? He changed the company's name and he made a $10 billion a year bet on the metaverse. Now, I don't know about you, but where I come from, when someone changes their name and just starts staking out a huge claim to an unproven technology, that's a bad sign. That's a warning sign. Um, you know, and look, the metaverse might be awesome and it might be, you know, highly monetizable and Facebook might be the first mover and Facebook might claim the lion's share of those spoils. But I don't invest in maybes. I invest in products that already are demonstrated to have a moat. And Facebook, by their behavior, has shown that they themselves don't think they have a moat. So that, to me, is a long-winded answer of describing why Microsoft and Apple have held up, but Facebook and Netflix have not. Really good explanations. And you know, sticking to the big tech theme, you talked about Amazon and Google in your book and why we've seen a difference in return on those companies specifically you pointed to Amazon's superior returns to just their really good management and their capital allocation decisions. And interestingly, when I dug into the numbers, it appears that Google's return on invested capital, to my surprise, has actually been better over the past decade. So I was surprised to see the difference in the actual stock performance versus the return on invested capital we're seeing. So I'm curious why you know, Google's return on invested capital has been better, but um, it actually hasn't flowed through to the actual stock price. I'm curious what your thoughts are on this. Hey guys, I wanted to give a quick shout out to Trade Coffee for supporting the Investors Podcast Network. I've always had trouble finding fresh coffee at the grocery store because a lot of the time it has been sitting on the shelves for weeks and eventually goes stale. Trade Coffee sells the freshest roasted and ethically sourced beans from America's best local roasters. They deliver right to your doorstep with free shipping as often as you'd like. I got started with Trade by taking their simple quiz online. It was super easy as they asked me a few questions such as how I make my coffee, whether I'm a coffee expert or beginner, and if I add milk or cream to my coffee. The results matched me with the Nebula Dark Roast. And let me tell you guys, I cannot get enough of it. 
It was roasted right here in the U.S. in Oakland, California, and it has a comforting and rich taste with added honey to help me satisfy my sweet tooth. Another reason I love Trade is because they support small businesses and ensure they're sourcing their beans from sustainable sources. Trade has delivered over 5 million bags of fresh coffee, and they have more than 750,000 positive reviews. If that isn't enough for you, Trade literally guarantees you'll love your first bag too, or they'll replace it for free. Right now, Trade is offering new subscribers a total of $30 off your first order plus free shipping when you go to drinktrade.com slash TIP or click the link in the description below. That's more than 40 cups of coffee for free. Get started by taking their quiz at drinktrade.com slash TIP and let Trade find you a coffee you'll love. That's drinktrade.com slash TIP for $30 off your first order. It's true that uh, on the reported numbers, Google or Alphabet, the parent company, has a higher return on capital than Amazon. But this brings up one of the critical points in my book, which is in the digital age, you can't really rely on reported financial statements. Now, that sounds like uh, Harris, right? Like here's a financial guy saying you can't rely on the, the audited financials. Well, I'll explain what I mean by that, by way of example. So in 2020, where, when I, which is the year in which I based the, my analysis of Amazon on their financial statements in 2020, their e-commerce business had a, had a profit margin of 2%. Walmart's profit margin was 6%. So if I'm to believe that 2% number, I implicitly assent to the assertion that Walmart is a third less profitable, I'm sorry, Amazon is a third less profitable than Walmart. Or put another way, Walmart is three times more profitable than Amazon. Now, here again, a 12-year-old would tell you that that's crazy. You know, Walmart has 5,000 stores to keep up. Amazon has a thousand distribution centers. Walmart has, you know, 1.5 million people in its stores and has to worry about shoplifting, which Amazon does not. Amazon gets, you know, paid immediately on credit card for all its purchases, which Walmart does not. Walmart has, it takes cash. Um, uh, uh, Amazon has a $30 billion a year advertising business where they just charge people to get prom- product placement on their website. They can do that because they have nearly a 50% share of all e-commerce. One of every two retail visits to the internet begins at wall- at uh, Amazon. So $30 billion a year of, of, of revenue is that advertising revenue should be pure profit. But you know how much the entire company reported an operating profit, even including the cloud business in 2020? $25 billion. So if you say that their ad business was all profit, that's $30 billion of operating profit, then everything else operated at a loss, which is nuts. So you, you, know, you can tell I get quite animated about this because economic reality is increasingly unhinged from the gap financial statements. And I go into it a little bit in the book where, you know, the gap was created in the 1930s in the wake of the depression to standardize accounting and rightly so. But it was based on an economy where General Motors and U.S. Steel dominated. So the rules were written for the industrial age. They were not written for the technological age. And they're really important differences between a tech company and a, an industrial company, you know, the most important of which is, you know, that the tech company spends most of its money, uh, you know, paying software developers to build products. And as I say in the book, those, many of those expenditures have a useful life of more than one year. But uh, Gap would have us believe that every dollar Amazon spends on its e-commerce website has a useful life of 365 days. And every dollar that Google spends on to improve its search engine, you know, evaporates after a year. And this is crazy. So that's why Amazon 
reported return on capital is much lower than its actual return on capital because there are all sorts of distortions in its income statement that make its return on capital look very low. Specifically, its profit margin. Its profit margin is not 2%. It's set, that's what Gap says. But you know, as I say in the book, Amazon's lost money on a reported basis for about a third of its public history. So if Bezos relied on the financial statements to run his company, he would have shut that thing down a long time ago. But he knows it's not unprofitable. He just knows that the financials are the gap financials are distorted. So that's a big part of what I say in the book is we as investors have to adjust the financials to account for economic reality. At some point, I think that the accountants will get involved and, and adjust them for us because, you know, because they're aware of how uh, f- how economic reality and, and, and gap financials are diverging. And uh, something's got to be done. But in the meantime, we've got to make adjustments. And by the way, this is not something like crazy, magical thinking. Like Ben Graham, the father of value investing, said, look, there are a lot of estimates in uh, financial statements. You've got to make intelligent adjustments. Buffett says the same thing. The whole concept of owner earnings is basically adjusting the gap financials to economic reality. So I'm just sort of continuing in in that vein you know it's sometimes easy to just look at these big tech names and focus on those but to find a company that is smaller that might eventually become the next big tech name where are some places we should start or maybe talk about some names that you like yeah i mean look it's a great question because we tend to focus on the fangs and the mega caps but there's a whole nother level down and then another level down from that you know of companies that that have secret sauce that have a moat that have um a competitive advantage that aren't nearly as well known as the fangs and these are potentially more excited exciting because they're less well known and well understood so i own a lot of intuit for example which owns uh you know it's an interesting company because it basically dominates two software platforms it dominates TurboTax, which helps one third of all americans uh do their taxes and it, it, it owns quickbooks and specifically quickbooks online and TurboTax is kind of a mature Buffett type consumer product, like like a third of all Americans do their taxes through TurboTax. Like where's that? It's hard to see that number getting materially bigger. So that's sort of a grind it out, you know, slowly churn out profit kind of product dominates its niche for sure. And they take all that cash flow, the profits from that, and they put it into QuickBooks online, which is far from mature. I mean, Intuit thinks they have, they've, got 1% of all their ultimate customers around the world that would use QuickBooks online. It's this software program that helps small businesses keep, you know, keep track of the beans, basically. And they say that their biggest co- competitors are Excel uh, and the shoebox, shoebox full of receipts for small business people. So it's a very slick uh, online product in the cloud. You can, you know, Keep your, you know, uh, put in your invoices and put in what you, you've been paid and put in what you owe. And it, and it basically runs your back office for you. It's, a, it's an excellent product, an affordable product. And, you know, QuickBooks Online has three times more subs than its nearest competitor. And they spend 12 times more than their nearest competitor in marketing and in research and development to make the product better. So <laughs> to my mind, it's sort of like an inevitable. It's, it's like what Buffett used to call Gillette and Coke. Like they have three times more subs. They spend 12 times more on marketing and R&D than their next nearest competitor. No one's going to catch them, but they only have 1% of their uh, ultimate addressable market. Like, whoa, that's cool. And I encourage your, your listeners to, to look for products like like that and and these products might be you know stuff that I don't know about and you don't know about but they know about it because it's in their line of work so someone in marketing might have an insight into Salesforce that I don't you know either they're they have moats or no they're extremely vulnerable you know someone in HR might understand that workday is you know no one's going to catch workday I don't under I don't know that but they might 
you know, I have a friend who uh, who is uh, an auditor, and he loves Alterix, which is a small tech company that dominates the market for uh, manipulating large data sets. Uh, he swears by it. So, you know, these are the companies that we should be looking for, companies that we're familiar with personally, that we are convinced have moats and, uh, you know, or are convinced that in 5, 10, 15, 20 years are going to be much bigger and more profitable than they are now. You know, you mentioned a little bit earlier, you know, this common theme that tech companies have looked expensive for years, you know, at least using those traditional metrics. But, you know, some have still managed to produce just extraordinary returns. And Amazon's a prime example of that. And our network actually had Bill Miller on our show. He, he had a interview with William Green and he bought Amazon at the IPO and bought even more during the tech crash after the 2000 tech bubble. How can we do what Bill Miller did and, you know, see through these traditional metrics and recognize we aren't overpaying for a high quality business? I guess, you know, for Amazon, for example, you mentioned that, you know, you would adjust the retail profit margin from 2% to say a 6%. So is it just a matter of saying if this was a mature business today, or maybe a few years out, how would you adjust those profit margins? Or how are you, you know, making those adjustments and, you know, determining a fair value? Well, another excellent question, because while you begin with business quality and moats, you must end with valuation. You know, I, I wouldn't have the right to call myself a value investor if I didn't believe that the price I was paying was an essential input of the value I was ultimately getting. You know, I say in the book, I can show you a Fifth Avenue penthouse with beautiful views and lovely rooms, but if I ask you to pay, you know, $25 billion for it, you're gonna tell me to go pound sand. You know, at some point, anything is too expensive. Um, so to answer your question specifically, like you have to start sort of big picture and then you kind of have to go more granular. So as I say in the book, like uh, there are examples of mature software companies that have already had the majority of their growth, like Oracle, for example, um, you know, the database company, fine company, but, you know, kind of grinding it out now. You know, their profit margin, operating profit margin approaches 50%. And, and that, that's about four times higher than an average American company. And it makes sense because, you know, one of the reasons software is tech companies have gotten so big so fast is their business models are inherently better. You know, let's begin with the fact that they have no cost of goods. Like, like they don't have to buy sugar, you know, lumber, you know, uh, anything. They don't have to buy titanium like Apple does. They, they just put a bunch of zeros and ones together and off they go. So a gross margin of a software company can be 80 to 90%. So they start with 30 to 40 percentage points head start over just any other company because they have no physical costs. So, so you start with that mindset. Okay, software companies are very profitable inherently when they're at steady state, when they're mature. So then you go, like when I, I say in the book, I looked at Google in 2015, 16, their operating profit margins reported was 25%. So that's half of 50. So that's a big gap, right? So they're potentially their profits could be two times higher, right? But then I started looking around at, you know, com comparable companies. So I started looking at Alibaba, which operates an asset light -like platform like Google, and their profit margins were in the 40, 45% range. And then I looked at Facebook, which, you know, as, as you know, I'm not a big fan of Facebook. And one of the many reasons I'm not a big fan of Facebook is they were, they're, they're short, they've been short-term greedy. They've been trying to monetize their network right now. So they put too many ads on there and they, you know, they didn't make the, the experience great. They, 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 they milked the business too quickly, but their profit margins were in the 40 to 50% range as well. So I said, okay, well, I don't know what Google's ultimate margin is, but I know it's high because, you know, it's a network. They have no cost of goods. 
once they've built the network, every incremental search query that comes in is basically 100% profit, right? Um, so their margins are probably not 25%. They're probably close to 50. So I just sort of said 40. Now, this is a rough exercise, but it's what Buffett used to call directionally accurate. He still calls things directionally accurate. And it's very important to be directionally accurate. And I say in the book, it's important to be comfortable with the fact that these are not precise calculations we're making. You know, we're not actuaries. You know, we're not rocket ship engineers where a millimeter here or there is going to, you know, destroy the rocket. We're just trying to sort of get a sense for whether this is a value purchase. So what I did with Alphabet or Google is I said, well, let's adjust their margins from 25% to 40, because that's sort of in line with their comps and you know mature software companies. And then let's just project their revenues forward a few years. Um, because you know, here again, like it was, it's inevitable that their revenues are going to grow. I mean, they still have a pretty small share of the overall ad market in the world, and they are the ad market destination of choice. Any podcast, any investment manager, any hairdresser, any divorce attorney, anybody willing to who needs to sell their service must in, must uh, advertise on Google. Period. So it was not crazy to just, you know, forecast their revenues three years in advance using their historical growth rate, put a 40% margin on that. And what I found was the reported earnings for this year was 28 times multiple, which doesn't sound like a great deal. But if you increase their margins and project three years ahead, the multiple was nine times. So I bought it and it's worked out well. And, and, and by the way, that is the primary reason why these stocks have looked expensive all the way up, but they've gotten so valuable because they're not trading on reported earnings and they're not trading on this year's numbers. They're trading on what, you know, what ultimately could be, you know, the market is a giant discounting, discounting mechanism. It discounts into the present what the future profits will be. And so it was a similar exercise with Amazon, Clay, although it was much more granular because Amazon has many more segments and Google has segments, but only one of them really makes much money, which is search. So that was a pretty easy analysis. But with, with Amazon, I just, you know, took every segment one by one, you know, uh, cloud, uh, uh, e-commerce, advertising, subscriptions, and just sort of went through with the same exercise that I did with Google, like what are the comparable companies trading for? You know, uh, what, you know, Walmart's margin is six. What, what Amazon's reported is two. Is that right? No. What could it be? You know, I kind of think I came up with the sort of the high single digits. So you just sort of have to kind of tinker with, with and, and ask intelligent questions and triangulate. You're kind of like a, you're kind of like a sailor without, modern day instruments. You just have to sort of triangulate with, with stars. Uh, and here again, it's not a precise exercise. And those of us who are uncomfortable with that imprecision probably should not be in the stock market. Um, we should probably, you know, um, do something else. But if you're comfortable with, you know, this feels about right, then you're going to do fine. Uh, you know, so I, I walk through, I have a whole chapter where I walk through my adjustments to Amazon uh, in the book. And, um, you know, these are the kind of adjustments we need to do. And then you can stress test the adjustments. As I say in the book, like if I said, you know, I think I said Amazon's e-commerce margin was probably 9%. Well, let's say you think I'm wrong and you say, well, no, it's no better than Walmart's. Okay, so put it down to six. It ends up not making that much of a difference. So you just have to kind of triangulate, quantify, play. And if you're kind of in the ballpark without having to push it too far, then you're probably right. If you're having to push it, push it, push it to make your numbers work, bad sign. It means you're probably wrong. You know, at the end of your checklist, you are looking at price and, you know, you're using that as your final check. Okay, is it investable or not? So... I'm curious if there's a specific earnings yield you're looking for or how you're determining your sort of hurdle rate. 
Yeah, I mean, I say in the book that I'm looking for a 5%, you know, free cash flow yield on adjusted numbers, you know, not on Amazon's reported numbers. You know, I think I, think I say in the book that Amazon's historical PE over since its IPO has been over 100, you know, at reported. Now, at the end of your checklist, you're looking at price last. And, you know, that's after you've gone through, you've looked at the management, you've looked at the business and the moat. I'm curious how you're determining sort of a hurdle rate or how do you determine, you know, yes, this is an appropriate price to pay. Are, are you looking at the earnings yield or what are you looking at there? Yeah, it's 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 earnings yield, Clay. Not not on reported gap numbers, but on you know the adjustments that we've been talking about. So I, I kind of feel naive, you know, for, for a great business with all these moats, you know, a five percent free cash flow yield is probably a good entry point. Twenty times earnings power. I think that. Uh, in my experience, will will yield a very good long term result because you have to remember with these companies that are growing, you know, if they're growing fifteen percent, you know, your multiple goes from twenty times to seventeen times to fourteen times to eleven times in three or four years. So, you know, the growth sort of bails you out, so to speak, of paying a high price initially. You know, Buffett learned this lesson the hard way. He had his own transition from a deep value, you know, Ben Graham type investor to a more, you know, high quality business when he would buy companies like C's Candies. You know, he fretted about paying an extra million or two million dollars for the company. And uh, I think I think since since they bought it, it's generated two billion with a B of excess profit. So he's learned, you know, that over time, good businesses bail you out uh, because they grow. And that's why that's why you begin with moats and you end with price. We've talked a lot about tech, but I'd imagine that you know, many stock investors don't want to just invest in tech. And I loved how you touched on some of these other types of businesses in your book. Given that we know that tech's going to play a very large part in our future, what sort of considerations should we be taking into account to ensure we're still making sound investment decisions, you know, investing still outside of tech? Yeah. Well, I don't think you should use tech as your primary filter. I think you should use moat as your primary filter. It just so happens that most of the moated growing businesses in the world, at least as I see it today, happen to be where tech happen to be in tech. That's why I call the book where the money is like I'm not particularly interested in tech. I don't particularly like tech. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't fool around with gadgets and stuff. I, I'm, you know, I'm hardly on social media, but it's, you know, it's where the money is. But, but there are also plenty of businesses, Clay, that are non-tech that have moats, and you know, we should be focusing on those. You know, businesses, as I say in the book, like Sherwin Williams, which has this incredible retail network of stores. Businesses like Dollar General, which you know serves for better or worse. You know, the poorer Americans who've been left behind by our post-industrial economy, you just want to find any sort of businesses that have that have an edge, that have a special sauce, you know, and, and it's OK if it's not in tech, you know, uh, it, you just want to find businesses that that have shown that they can withstand competition. You know, I mean, sure, William is growing tw- twice as fast as the rest of the U.S. paint industry. The only reason is because they have like five times more retail stores than their nearest competitor. And every year they build a uh, hundred more stores and their nearest competitor builds 10. So their moat is widening. Their moat is growing. And uh, that's the kind of company you want to look for tech or not. Hmm. You know, back to some of those smaller companies we discussed earlier you know, I can't help but think about the environment we've seen the last couple of years. One of the, you know, you see many of these companies take this roller coaster round trip where, you know, the COVID pandemic hit and the easy money came along and these high flyers just took off. And then, you know, now the Fed has put, 
you know, an enormous pressure on those companies. And now they're back to where they were pre COVID. So, you know, just as, as an example, Roku is a company, I think, you know, potential to be a really good company. And I believe you mentioned them in the book as well. You know, so it's hard for me to think about how that company might grow into the future when we see a, an environment of higher rates um, and maybe not as much easy money and credit in the system. So I'm curious what your thoughts are around that. Well, I think you're making a, a, a logical error, uh, Clay, in the sense that higher rates have nothing to do with moats. Higher rates have to do with valuation. So when interest rates are higher, every financial instrument, including and especially equities, gets less valuable. So from that point of view, um, this correction is is quite rational. You know, when the when the, the when the discount rate of, for for financial instruments, including equities, goes up, the net present value of those equities goes down. So that's the easy money portion. You know, whether Roku has a moat has nothing to do with Fed, the Fed, and easy money, and da 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 da. da. It just has to do with, you know, let's get a bunch of teenagers in here and talk about Roku. Like, how safe is it? How safe is it from competition? So I don't recommend or say I'm invested in Roku in the book. I say, you know, if I had been thinking about, um, you know, how companies interpose themselves and make themselves valuable, uh, maybe I would have looked at Roku. So Roku is valuable because I think it has a 35% market share uh, 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 for, for the devices that connect televisions to streaming services. And most of their money now is made not on selling the devices. It's made on uh, advertising because they say to uh, uh, Netflix or Amazon or whoever, like, you know, you've got a great business here. I'd hate for you to see, hate for something bad to happen to it. You know, maybe you pay me a little, a little bit of your subscription revenues or your ad revenues, and uh, and I'll guarantee that everything keeps flowing. So they've gotten leverage over those companies, which is why it was a monster stock. Now the question is, you know, is it a monster from a business point of view? Is it a monster from a business point of view? How secure is its position? between the streaming service and the television. I've looked at it a little bit because in this kind of market, you want to look you know, at stocks that are down 80%. You want to say, well, because it's classic case of you know, babies and bathwater. You know? A lot of these stocks deserve to, deserve to be marked down. You know, they, they, don't, they don't make money. There's no prospect of them making money. Uh, they have no moat. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So the, it's exciting time because you want to figure out which of these companies actually do have a moat and are getting thrown out. Like you know, Amazon went down 80, 90 percent in the dot com bust, and when the firm I was at bought it back then because we thought it had a moat, sold it too soon, of course. But this is what you want. You want to. This is a great time to look. And so I've looked at Roku a little bit, and you know, I'm not an expert in it, but. You know, I have a I have a tendency not to like hardware companies. It's why I missed Apple, because they're so easily replaceable. Your software is very hard to replace once it's on your machine. Uh, whereas Roku, like tomorrow, I could swap out my Roku and buy a, an Amazon device. And increasingly, televisions are being equipped with, you know, Roku-like devices built into them. So I'm not so sure they have a moat. Um, but I'll bet you someone out there knows more than I do. And if they disagree uh, and if they, they've convinced themselves that Roku has a moat, then I can tell you it's a screaming buy. You mentioned how, you know, your firm sold Amazon too early. And you did mention in your book that, you know, you're in and out of Amazon a number of times. So I'm, yeah. cu- I'm curious, uh, you know, what led you to, maybe making that decision to sell and, you know, was it a, you know, opportune times to sell or was it like you mentioned where you, you essentially regret selling it because of, you know, you know, 
maybe had maybe a shorter time horizon and maybe saw a better opportunity yeah. at that time. So I'm curious what your in, thoughts are there. Until 2020 and the pandemic came and, and I got a shot to, to buy Amazon uh, down 30 percent, you know, I was really sort of flailing with Amazon because I was a traditional value investor. I understood it was a great business. I understood that no one was going to catch them. I understand that they were going to grow to multiples of their size. That I all I all understood, but I was still anchored to the published financials, and they always looked expensive to me on the published financials. So it wasn't until I had this kind of come to Jesus moment six or seven years ago, where I said, you know what, the published financials might not be economic reality. Like Jeff Bezos is not looking at the published financials to run his business. So I better figure out, you know, essentially what he's figured out. I better look at, you know, the economic underlying reality of Amazon, as opposed to, you know, what gap this industrial era accounting system is telling me is real. And once I did that, I could see much more clearly that not only was Amazon a great business and well run, which I knew, but it was also cheap. Well, Adam, thank you so much for joining me today. I really enjoyed reading your book. If you guys enjoyed this conversation, I recommend you guys check it out where the money is. Adam, before we close out the episode, I want to give you a chance to give a handoff to our audience, to the book, and whatever else you're working on. Well, thanks, Clay. I really appreciate the, the time and, and, and the questions were excellent. So thanks for the close read of the book. Um, you know, if people are interested in the book, they can uh, go to simonandschuster.com and put in uh, where the money is. Um, you know, as I said, I don't use social media that much. I understand its power, but I don't, not, not, not particularly fond of using it personally. So, but I am active on LinkedIn. So if people want to hit me up on LinkedIn, I'm happy to interact with folks there. And then of course, uh, if you don't want to go to Simon and Schuster's webpage, there's always uh, amazon.com. Thanks a lot, Adam. Clay, thanks again. Thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on our next podcast episode and new investing resources. What are your takeaways and thoughts about this discussion? Let us know in the comments section below.